we change to the ones, viral diseases that we typically get from vertebrate animals. And the most important of these in terms of death and human health response is rabies. Um, and this is still the virus with the highest case fatality rate. It's 99.999%. So it's, it's a, um, once you have a case of this, the outcome is not good. Uh, we've already gone over the viral life cycle. It's an RNA virus. It's an enveloped RNA virus. And you'll see that comes important in your initial dealings with somebody who's been bitten by a rabid animal. Uh, it's a member of the Lyssa virus genome. Lyssa means mad, um, refers to the uh, odd behavior of uh, originally <coughs> dogs infected with this. And, and also humans can present with all sorts of presentations, including apparent insanity, but uh, that's not the typical probably way they present. Uh, it's, as I say, enveloped a single-stranded RNA virus, negative sense, uh, very stable, single serotype. Okay, this is a little thing from the CDC called Nerve Man, and it looks pretty simplistic, but actually it kind of tells the story. And actually they also have one called Blood Man, uh, and so if you're looking at the arboviruses, blood man is the story. You get bitten, it's put into the bloodstream, it, it replicates in endothelial cells and macrophages and then spreads out through the tissues. Uh, nerve man, the bite, if it, the bite's down on the leg, the virus may replicate in, in the muscle locally for a little while, but then it spreads through the nerves up to the central nervous system and that's where the, um, the real problems lie in terms of symptoms. And then it spreads back down and can spill out in places like the salivary glands, um, the cornea, other tissues. So simplistic as it is, if you remember that, that tells you a lot about rabies. It spreads by the nerves, not by the blood system. You get no viremia or no detectable viremia. So the transmission is usually by a bite um, from a rabid animal, and that can be any of the numerous species of animals that can carry rabies. But there have been other routes of transmission which you need to be aware of. One is via corneal and other kinds of transplants. Uh, and we still get cases. There was a SAG case um, a few years ago, which I think I have included a slide on at the, after the end of the lecture. So if you want to go over a case history, there's an abbreviated case history there of a situation where somebody uh, gave their, do their organs don as a donation and it wasn't realized that the person apparently had already got rabies. Um, so the cause of death, if I remember right, was either an infarction or an aneurysm, something like that. It wasn't anything that was obviously connected with rabies, uh, and it wasn't realized. Uh, corneal transplants have been a big problem, and also uh, we're going to be talking in the second lecture about prion diseases, and they've also been a problem in that. So one thing is now the eye banks are extremely cautious about taking the medical history of anybody who's donating corneas. Uh, and if you're donating corneas and there's any kind of mental problem which might be associated with early onset of dementia for uh, either of these diseases, um, then those corneas are not taken for transplant. So there's, it's caused a big increase in the caution. Uh, mucosal membranes, it can be transmitted via contact of wounds or um, damaged mucosal membranes with the material that's infected with rabies, usually saliva. Um, so it has been transmitted without an actual physical bite from the animal, just with contact between an open wound uh, and infected sal and saliva from an infected animal because when it spreads back down from the brain, it spreads through the nerves into the saliva glands and then it's replicated there and released. And occasionally uh, it's been transmitted by an aerosol um, that's extremely rare. Uh, the, it can theoretically happen. It has happened in lab accidents, um, possibly, uh, but it's uh, extremely rare. The idea that you can readily get it from aerosols uh, doesn't hold water. It, it, there's been very few proven cases where it's been transmitted by aerosol. Okay, so this is just nerve man shown uh, in a more... Uh, complicated manner from the textbook, but it's basically nerve man again. They, so the dog bites or some other animal, 
Um, the wound gets infected because the virus is in the saliva. Uh, there is local replication um, to a limited extent in the muscle, but then it gets into the endings of the peripheral nerves, spreads up through the peripheral nerves um, to the dorsal root ganglia and then up to the brain. Um, and this is part of the problem uh, because while it's spreading through the nerves, if you can raise uh, an antibody response, you can stop it passing from one synapse to another because that situation, it's out in the medium, it's available to uh, antibodies. Uh, but once it gets to the central nervous system, it spreads very rapidly up the spinal cord. Uh, and so once it gets to the central nervous system, it's too late to respond to it. So what you need to do is respond to it before it gets to the central nervous system. Um, <coughs> And here it infects a whole pile of structures and then it replicates in the central nervous system and then it spreads down through nerves back down again. Now, the rate of spread depends on the distance of the nerve from the central nervous system. So the further away from the central nervous system you're bitten, uh, the longer it tends to take to develop on average. Uh, and similarly, when you were looking for it in the tissues, uh, again, it takes a while for it to spread that down the nerve. So the first places you look are in the head and neck region. So you can detect it um, readily at very early stages in, in the eye, um, obviously in the brain itself, and also in the neck because the nerves that innervate the neck are very close to the central nervous system. And so if you take uh, samples from the neck, you can sometimes find it in the nerve endings around the hairs and so on as it gets back down there. So you tend to look at the head and neck region when you're trying to find signs of virus infection. The incubation period is extremely variable, somewhere between a couple of weeks and almost a couple of years. Uh, and this can make it extremely difficult to track down and cause, find out the causes for some of these people. But usually um, you can work out the causes and you'll see how later on. Um, the average time for infection is about, uh, for obvious clinical symptoms from the time of the exposure, is about two months. So that's something to remember because until you get the symptoms, the symptoms are once it gets into the central nervous system and by then it's almost always too late. Uh, to do anything much for the patient other than supportive care. And people try, and we have one case, which I will briefly mention, but the vast majority of people, whatever you do, um, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, so, but while, before you get clinical symptoms, while it's still in the periphery, if you can raise an antibody response and stop it spreading, uh, then you can prevent, protect the patient. So this is an unusual virus. Because it's so slow, you do post-exposure prophylaxis. So you give an, a vaccine after the exposure uh, because you've got time to raise an antibody response and protect the patient. And you will do this even months after an exposure because given the possible outcome, it's well worth trying to protect somebody by vaccinating even if it's a long time after the original exposure. If you find that they had an exposure that was not realized at the time, you could go back and vaccinate them a long time afterwards. So the symptoms, the problem with the symptoms is you get the kind of symptoms you would get with a regular viral infection, fever, headache, malaise, anorexia. Um, and then you get the sort of symptoms you will get from um, a generalized infection of the brain. So you get nausea, vomiting, hydro. Well, hydrophobia is, I'll uh, come back to in a second, um, confusions, hallucinations, seizures, paralysis. Uh, these kind of symptoms are pretty nonspecific, and it's actually been extraordinarily difficult to diagnose many of these rabies cases. So an amazing number of them are not diagnosed until post-mortem. The problem with that is you want to vaccinate any contacts with the rabid animal as soon as you can. You want to prevent possibility of exposure of people in close contact with the patient to the virus. So what you want to be sure of is that you recognize this as quickly as possible so that you can get your post-exposure prophylaxis underway. Uh, but if, you don't, if, you, if it's this difficult to diagnose, it's often not recognized. But even if, as I say, it takes several months to recognize these things, you still go and do the post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, 
one thing that you, was sort of typical of this disease in dogs was some hydrophobia, which is fear of water. You see it in some patients as well. Um, it uh, seems to be that the, the nerves involved in swallowing can get sort of super sensitive and it can be a real problem swallowing and the dog or the patient starts choking and then they get scared of going into one of these choking fits so they'd rather not drink than choke. Um, that's how I was it was explained to me what they think the sort of underlying cause of this is. But um, you can get a very sort of, these nerves can become sort of super sensitive. So um, people can start sort of uncontrollable um, gagging and things like this in response to these. So uh, hydrophobia is by no means always seen and it's by no means diagnostic. Difficulty in swallowing is a com all sorts of problems can lead to difficulty in swallowing. And I mean, I saw it with my father-in-law when he had problems after a stroke and he didn't want to eat food that he thought would cause this reflex to start going because it's so un unpleasant. So he didn't get hydrophobia. But these kinds of difficulty in swallowing can lead to people not wanting to eat or not wanting to drink. But in this case, they can be exacerbated. So the standard kind of things you would expect to see from a serious brain infection um, and this virus does major damage to the nerve cells. Um, but it seems that it's, it doesn't actually kill them. It just sort of shuts them down while it takes over. So that's going to come back when I talk a little bit about this one case that managed to survive. So one hope has always been that if you can see a patient through the disease and support them through everything that they need, they can come out the other side and recover. Um, unfortunately, the hopes on that have been dashed more often than not. So diagnosis is the presence of neutralizing antibodies in the serum or in the cerebrosalpino fluid. Unfortunately, by the time you see those neutralizing antibodies, it's too late. That's because the virus has already got to the central nervous system and replicated. So uh, you want to get this patient to have, you, you want somebody who's bitten to develop these neutralizing antibodies before it gets to the central nervous system. And the way to do that is vaccinate. Um, you detect the virus usually uh, by one, well, one useful way is via direct fluorescence antibody. Um, and you can, as I say, you can take a sample from the nape of the neck, um, it, the hairs, the nerves surrounding the hairs, are frequently a good place to look. Um, if necessary, you can take a brain biopsy. Uh, these are also things that you will do if you want to find out whether the animal that bit the person was rabid, uh, you do similar things. Um, you can look for the viral RNA by using reverse transcriptase PCR of the saliva. Uh, that is also widely used. Uh, and you can do post-mortem staining of, of the brain where you can see typical uh, cytoplasmic inclusions. Remember, this is a cytoplasmic virus, replicates in the cytoplasm, assembles in the cytoplasm. So it forms these inclusion bodies in the cytoplasm, which are viral nuclear capsids because it makes huge amounts of them. Temporarily, it takes over the cell hugely. So here, they are staining with a, an antibody to the nuclear protein. Remember, this is an RNA virus. The RNA is encapsidated in that N protein. All the full length intermediates during replication are encapsulated in the M protein. So this virus is full of all these intermediates in replication, positive and negative sense. They're all coated with the nuclear protein. And so you get huge amounts of the nuclear protein in the cytoplasm. If you stain with a fluorescent antibody, you see this fluorescent staining. Negri bodies. Um, the Negri saw these bodies sometime in, I think it was the late 1800s. And he actually thought they were the causative organism at the time, but they're not. They're nuclear capsid um, agglomerations in the cytoplasm. Um, and so what you see are these typical staining. Again, if you handle a lot of rabies cases and you're used to doing the stain, um, you can be fairly good at seeing these, but it's not something that is terribly easy to do. If you see these, they are very typical and they tend to have these um, basophilic granules within them and this kind of appearance with, with certain stains. I, the previous one was H&E, this is Sellers. Um, but they are, you don't see them in every case and there are some other things which look sometimes somewhat like them. 
So you need somebody who's got a lot of experience with these, and it's not really terribly used these days, but boards are going to ask you about negri bodies. So negri bodies are, what you see them in the cytoplasm of nerves in the central nervous system. They're typical of rabies infection. And a true negri body is, as I say, a, it's a, a, cytop a, a cytoplasmic inclusion body, which consists of this RNA and these nuclear capsids. So it stains with both positive and negative stains. Okay, so as I said, there's a single serotype, fortunately. It's, uh, despite being an RNA virus, it's one of these that is very stable because apparently anything which changes its external antigenic appearances also has a negative effect on the virus growth and replication. So it's very stable. So that means that the serum protects you worldwide, uh, the vaccine protects you worldwide. And worldwide, the vast majority, 95% and more, of rabies deaths are associated with dogs or other members of the dog family, wolves, coyotes, etc. So worldwide, those are the major animals you have to be worried about. But in this country, canine rabies is kept heavily under control uh, because of pet vaccination programs, because of awareness uh, of weirdly behaving animals. So we have, we have canine rabies in this country, but it's very rare uh, that you're bitten by a rabid dog. If you are bitten by a rabid dog, you tend to know it and, and appropriate action is taken immediately. But, so in this country, rabies in dogs is present, but in the dogs that you're likely to meet, relatively rare. And if your pet meets a wild dog that's got rabies, if your pet is vaccinated, it stops the transmission cycle there. But if you are bitten by a dog that's behaving abnormally, you will, we hope, go and see a physician, or at least by you, I mean the people in the population. They will go and see one of you uh, and report the situation. And then you'll call DHEC, and between you and DHEC, you will work out whether this person is really at risk and whether they need the prophylaxis, the post-exposure prophylaxis. So it's extremely rare for anybody in this country to die of dog rabies uh, because of this whole chain of things. Elsewhere, dog rabies is prevalent, the access to, to care and vaccine is not, uh, and therefore you get a lot of rabies deaths. In the US, most of the, the cases so that we have seen recently where there have been deaths due to rabies um, are due to bats. And part of the reason for that is it's not that the bats are the major carriers. We've got lots of other skunks carry it, raccoons carry it, a lot of animals carry it. But most animals, if they bite you and they're behaving abnormally, you will go and get medical care. So if you're savaged by a raccoon, you'll probably think this is pretty weird and you'll go and get medical care. But one of the problems is bats have got very, very sharp little teeth. And if you sit, people are not familiar with bats. They sort of know how a raccoon should behave or how a dog should behave, but they're not familiar with bats. Uh, and so they will handle bats. And as I say, bats have got really sharp little teeth, so you get things that are like paper cuts. Nobody bothers to go to the physician for a paper cut, and so they don't get the post-exposure prophylaxis because the community as a whole are not terribly well informed about the danger of bat rabies. Very few bats have rabies, but the problem is, as I say, when you're bitten by other rabid animals, you tend to get the appropriate medical care. When you're bitten by bats, there tends not to be that. So if you see a bat flopping around on your lawn, you may pick it up and put it in the shrubs before you mow the lawn. And it doesn't cross your mind that this is an aberrant bat. If you saw a, ra a raccoon rolling over and over in the middle of your lawn, you wouldn't pick it up and say, oh, isn't he sweet and he's just slobbered all over me. Um, you'd take appropriate care. So this is the, the problem with the bats. And very frequently, people don't, are not even aware that they've had an exposure. So we think they had an exposure, but you can't actually prove it. But you know that they've been handling bats. So in recent cases, in the last, um, the date, since 1990, we've had 48 cases and 75% of those were a bat-associated strain. How do we know? One of the things is, I said, there's a single serotype. So antigenically, rabies is constant. But if you look at the rabies that's circulating in the skunk population, the raccoon population, the coyote population, the mongoose population in Puerto Rico, um, the, rab the bats, what you find is, if you sequence them, there are nucleotide changes. So each one has got typical nucleotide changes, just small little changes. 
So when they do this PCR of the vet rabies RNA, CDC sequence it, and they try and work out whether you've got a strain which is typically circulating in bats, and even within bats, certain types of bats tend to have one variant versus another. So they look at these variants. The variants are all equally susceptible to the vaccine, thank goodness, uh, but it does enable you to track down whether you think this was a dog exposure, uh, a skunk, raccoon, bat. So that's really what. Uh, and we, in this last 15 years or so, we've had 11 cases of dog-associated rabies, and 10 of those were acquired outside the U.S. It was just one case of acquired within the U.S. So we do get dog rabies in this country, but most people who are bitten by a dog will get care. And just to make this point, um, here is just the latest one I found. It was not quite Halloween, uh, but two people in Marion County in South Carolina are under doctor's care and receiving inoculations to prevent rabies after coming in contact with a stray dog that tested positive for the disease. This appears on the DHEC site every few weeks. You get another of these announcements. This isn't rare. And in fact, um, about 400 people in South Carolina go, get preventive treatment for rabies every year. Uh, we've had people in the M2 class who have had friends uh, who've had this treatment. We had a secretary in our department whose little boy uh, was in contact with a pet pig and it died and apparently it wasn't behaving too well and DHEC called and said, you know, do you want to vaccinate? It was six months ago, but uh, we just found out about this and if you want to vaccinate, come in and discuss this with it. So you see this all over the place. And this shows current distribution, as I say, mongoose in, in Puerto Rico. On this coast, in the wild population, it's predominantly raccoons, but of course, they can come into contact with cats and dogs. And so what we normally see is where it's built up, or frequently see is where it's built over into the cat and dog population. And then people handle those. But it can occur in all sorts of animals, very wide host range. Skunks, foxes, coyotes, and of course, bats. Um, small rodents are rarely infected, uh, but the population, again, is convinced that, you know, no rodent can give it to you. Uh, again, it, it's wise to seek appropriate care. But to uh, woodchucks, groundhogs, whistling pigs, whatever you want to call them, the things that tell you whether or not it's going to be a long winter or not can be carrying rabies. So if he looks, out, looks at you, bites you and goes back in his hole, get care. <laughs> And as I say, the, the, the bats, don't blame the bats too much. They, it's not that they're hugely uh, associated with rabies. It's just that we don't associate this as being a risk factor, or at least the vast majority of the population don't. Um, and I've already said it can be transmitted human to human surgically via transplants. Uh, theoretically, you could get it from nursing, but no human to human transmission has ever actually been documented. Um, which is surprising, but that turns out to be the case. So, <coughs> theoretically, since you know it's in the saliva and the secretions, you know the, it's in the tears from the eye. Um, you would think that if you weren't using appropriate nursing care, and if it, you could catch it, uh, but nobody in this country has ever obtained it that way. Now, if you realize that the patient that people were nursing had rabies, then you go back and you talk, look at how, how much of risk factor they had, what kind of nursing was used, and determine whether they need post-exposure prophylaxis. And you normally err on the side of caution. But this is an expensive vaccine. Uh, and currently, it's not as nasty as it used to be. Uh, so, but, you know, you still don't necessarily want to just give it to the whole population. So you, you target it to the people at risk, but you're fairly conservative about who's at risk. And these are the decisions. DHEC controls how much can... So the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control controls the vaccine. So they will determine who gets vaccinated. So the physicians contact them. They, they deal with the risk factors. They see if they can get the animal and test it. You have a little bit of a window here, um, so you can look at a few things. So what do you do if you're bitten by one of these? One thing is you clean the wound and what they recommend is soap and water, alcohol, benzyl alconium chloride. Um, that's a frequent, uh, a lot of these um, 
antibacterial kitchen and bathroom um, compo uh, disinfectants include benzyl alkonium chloride. Um, these kinds of things, one thing is you want to get as much of virus as possible out of the wound, so it's just physically removing it. And secondly, since it's enveloped, if you can get rid of that envelope immediately, that limits the amount. So the hope is to limit the amount of virus as quickly as possible. So if you're out in the woods and all you've got is a bottle of Jack Daniels, use it. Okay, and then think medical care. Um, because then, and the state health department will determine the risk, examine the animal if available. There are all kinds of rules about what you should do if it's a vaccinated animal versus an unvaccinated animal uh, versus a wild animal. Uh, and then um, if there is a risk, you vaccinate. Uh, and currently there are a choice of vaccines. I think the human diploid cell vaccine is still the most popular um, and as I say, there are all sorts of horror stories about how dreadful this vaccine is. Those horror stories really go back to the vaccine that was being used like 25, 30 years ago. The current vaccine is not nearly so bad. It's a of course of multiple shots though. Um, and what you also do is you use human rabies immune globulin. So this is immune globulin isolated from individuals who have a very high titer of anti-rabies antibody. Uh, and you get this and you take it and you infiltrate it around the wound. So the idea is you've cleaned out as much virus as you can physically, you've inactivated as much virus as you can with things that attack envelopes like soap, alcohol, and benzyl alkonium chloride. Um, and then you infiltrate antibody to also try and neutralize this. So your hope is this virus tends to take a fairly slow start. You try and do everything you can to stop it even starting because it's much better to stop it in its tracks at this stage. Um, you put as much as you can around the wound, and then the rest of this you put into a, a muscle to include, increase the amount of uh, immune globulin that the person has circulating. You obviously use a different needle than you do for the vaccine, <laughs> and you don't put it in the same site because you don't want to just neutralize the vaccine before it's got any chance to do anything. It's a killed vaccine. The, the, the vaccine for humans is a killed one. Some people do get vaccinated at pre-exposure. So you can use the vaccine to protect people who are likely to be at risk. Uh, and that includes veterinarians and their staff members, wildlife officers who might well come in contact with rabid animals. In fact, if you're bitten by a rabid animal and it's roaming around the neighborhood, these are the people who are going to kind of catch it so that it can be tested whether it is rabid or not. Um, travelers to areas which are likely to be at risk um, and that's one thing to remember. If people are traveling, they should be aware of this risk because it's around in many countries. And some of these imported cases are because people weren't aware of it. Um, and people who work on rabies. Uh, obviously, lab accidents happen, and so they need to be protected as well. So these people are vaccinated, and then they get tested at regular intervals. And if the antibody levels are falling, um, you can revaccinate. And these are the people who donate their immune globulin to that, so that human rabies uh, immune globulin, that HRIIG, that HRIG that you use to infiltrate the wound. <coughs> so if you've got pre-exposure prophylaxis, you vaccinate them, you regularly test, and you give boosters to people who are still at risk. And they still need post-exposure prophylaxis. So you're not totally protected. Um, again, you probably got pretty good protection, but nobody wants to take any risks with this virus. Um, one unvaccinated person has been documented to survive from it, and there are tens of thousands of cases of rabies every year worldwide. So you still need post-exposure prophylaxis, um, and you but for those people who are pre vaccinated, it's a, a reduced course of vaccinations, and they don't need the HRIG. They've already got their own immunoglobulin, so they don't need that. So they get a, a, a lighter load of treatment, but they still need to be treated if exposed. And as I say, once the treatment's developed, the treatment is virtually always unsuccessful. About the best you can give is intensive supportive care, make the patient as comfortable as possible, uh, and just look after them. 
Um, there have been six cases of documented recovery from people who've had the symptoms of rabies and have made it through. Um, and most of these have had serious problems after they recovered. Um, but five of those cases had received <coughs> prophylaxis. They just hadn't received the full proper course of prophylaxis, so they were regarded as being underprotected. Um, so they, had, they weren't completely naive. There's just one case uh, a couple of years ago in Wisconsin of a 15-year-old girl who was bitten by a bat. Or, or we don't know that she was bitten by a bat. She got a, she got a hole in her finger handling a bat, so I guess she was bitten. Um, the bat flew into a column in a church and flopped on the floor. And, you know, again, with bats, you, say, you don't say, that's a weirdly behaving bat. Why is it flying around at church service time? It should be roosting. And why on earth did it fly into a column? If you saw a woodpecker fly into a tree and smash its head and fall to the floor, you'd say, that's a sick woodpecker. People tend to assume that bats are just stupid. Uh, so, so she picked up the bat, took it outside the church, very nice of her, to let it go free. Um, her wound was a small wound, but it was treated with hydrogen peroxide. And then nothing happened for a month or two, and then she came down with rabies. Um, she had a, an experimental treatment, which is quite fascinating. If you want to read it, I can give you the reference. Um, but basically, the idea was to put her in a coma so that her brain was completely shut down so, and give her as many antivirals as they could think of giving her with the hope that the brain not doing anything else other than trying to make it through rabies would make it through. And she's done remarkably well. Uh, went back to school, is doing academically well, has learnt to drive. So um, she did do it. But the question is, well, you know, was this... Hydrogen peroxide is not what you recommend for the wound, um, but maybe it inactivated a lot of the virus. So was it a very small load? Did that help? Was it, that, was it a maybe a very weak strain? They never managed to isolate the virus that actually caused the, from her, so they don't know what it was caused. Was this a lucky fluke? They have tried that treat, the same treatment she was given on four or five other people since at least. <coughs> And it hasn't worked, unfortunately, in those cases. So nobody quite knows why it worked then, um, not since. But it's. Uh, but basically, you put somebody into a coma and have to look after every every system for them for for a month or two. What the medical bills were like, I wouldn't like to think about. So this isn't something that's going to be usable uh, worldwide. Okay, so are there any questions about rabies? <coughs> okay, the question was, it depends on the site of the bite as to how long it takes to get to the central nervous system. Um, we don't really know uh, because it's not ethical to do any infection studies on humans. Uh, but there were, there are Things, for example, at the time when Pasteur was working, um, there would be wolf attacks. Uh, there were a serious problem with rabid wolves in the Middle East. And so there would be wolf attacks on villages. And what was discovered was that the people who were bitten around the head and neck came down with rabies way earlier than the people who were bitten around the legs and the feet. But, you know, it's also a question of how much rabies did you get. But one thing is this ascension through the nerves from the muscles up to the central nervous system seems to be pretty slow. So given how many feet it has to travel, it's pretty slow. And apparently it makes that trip pretty slowly. Once it gets into the central nervous system, it seems to go up very rapidly. But the, the trip to the central nervous system. So in, it's been shown in um, animal models of rabies um, that if you bite in the appropriate, if you give it the injection in the appropriate place and you cut the sciatic nerve, then the animal doesn't go down with rabies. So it seems that it's a purely nerve spread as far as getting the disease goes. Months. Um, it can be months. It can be. Uh, this girl was bitten on the hand, and it was like um, a month to six weeks later that she came down with obvious symptoms. But some people, it may be a year or more later. Um, there, there was a very sad case in Nepal some years ago. An American girl was in Nepal. She was bitten by a dog in the central marketplace there. Somebody said to her, you know, some of these dogs might be rabied. Maybe you should go to the hospital. She went. They didn't have any rabies vaccine. 
She was off on her way to Thailand. They said, try and get it in Thailand because she got time to get it. So she got to Thailand and they didn't have any. She was on her way to Australia, so she got to Australia. Australia has no rabid animals. So Australia has rabies vaccine reserves, but they don't have them on a local basis. So they said it's going to be a couple of days before we can get it. And she got her onward ticket to the States booked, and she wasn't going to hang around for a couple of days. By the time she got back, friends were saying, well, look, you know, it's three weeks since you were bitten. Forget about it. So she sort of went around, and then she came down with rabies a bit later. Never listen to your friends on something like that. (laughs) Uh, So this was a case of she'd still probably got time when she came back to the States. But, uh, but sometimes it seems to go very quickly. And I guess one of the things is, is, you know, does it go to a very well innovated bit of muscle or a poorly innovated bit of muscle? How, many, how much was in the wound? Was the wound cleaned? Things like this are going to really affect the rate. Any other questions on rabies? No question. Oh, because transplants have nerves in them, unfortunately. Well, for example, with, with, the, um, with the corneal transplants, um, the, tr- the nerves in the cornea, the transplanted cornea, will be releasing the virus, and then it can spread to the nerves that have their connections nearby. So it's probably infecting other nerves. There have been uh, one thing I didn't mention there, but um, since bats hang out in caves, um, Spelunkers, cave people, I mean, what you call it, cave explorers. Uh, Spelunkers is the technical word. Um, Spelunkers are vaccinated because there there have been cases in animal studies where if you put an animal in a cage so that it can't hug a bat, it it has picked up um, rabies from a highly rabied bat colony. Um, so it seems you can get it into the lungs, and one of the ideas there is that maybe you can get it aerosol, and again, it gets in through nerve endings in the lung. So it seems that it can replicate in a few cells. Muscle, it seems to recognize some receptors on muscles, so we think in muscle cells, um, but it can also replicate in nerve cells. So uh, uh, the nerves can still be spreading it, even though they've been cut, unfortunately. And, of course, in transplant patients, they're immune suppressed into the bargain, but it's not clear how much the immune system protects you. Um, As I say, you don't don't find... By the time people get immune globulin, it's too late. Any other questions? So, again, this is kind of story I was telling you with the arboviruses. The important point is public health information uh, and getting the story out. And, I mean, one thing that amazed me here is the auxiliary service people will remove a a bat from somebody's lab and not think there's anything weird about it at all. All I keep trying to tell them, you know, you should be wearing gloves to do that. You should be very careful. Okay. So rabies, as I say, is really a critical one. Um, But we get other diseases from animals, uh, and I'm just going to to mention some of them. And so these are largely the rodent-borne ones that I'm going to be talking about next. Um, And the major family here are the arena viruses, um, which are helical, loosely wrapped envelope viruses, um, and the hantavirus genus of the bunyaviruses. We already talked about the bunyaviruses in the arbovirus lecture because most species of bunyaviruses are transmitted by insects, uh, but the hantavirus genus is transmitted by rodents. Um, They both have helical symmetry. They're both RNA viruses. Um, We talked about negative and positive sense RNA viruses. Some viruses manage to have a bit of genome that's one and a bit of genome that's the other, so they're called ambisense, and the arena viruses are ambisense. So some of their stuff is... Some of their genes are the same sense as their genome. Some are opposite sense. Uh, the bunyaviruses <coughs> are negative. And both of these are segmented, which theoretically means you can get reassortant. Um, but uh, at the moment, that doesn't seem to have created a huge problem. So how do you get infected by these animals? This time, it's not by a bite. Um, it's by contaminated material. They release the virus in the urine, um, in their feces, in I guess 
they cough and spit or something, it, it can be released from their respiratory tract. I mean, I'm not sure. I've never seen a coughing mouse, but they probably do. So basically, they drop them in these materials. And the viruses, although they are enveloped, are, are relatively stable. And they're particularly stable if they're in droppings, you know, protected from the environment by whatever else is in the dropping. Um, so what happens is they put these droppings around the place. Uh, humans go and sweep them up and create a lovely aerosol, uh, and then they breathe the aerosol down into their lungs and get infected. So that's the standard route of infection. Uh, and in fact, when there are outbreaks of this, again, you go to the CDC site, and they have these movies and slideshows of how to clean your house uh, if you've got a, a, a rat infection or a rodent infestation in an area where these viruses are circulating heavily. Um, and the one thing you don't do is you don't go and dry, you, you use liquids, you make sure you don't get aerosols, um, you use liquids which will inactivate these, they're membrane envelope viruses, so you, you can try and do that. And then you're very careful and, and prevent breathing in aerosols and so on and so forth. So the CDC is getting into how to clean your patio for the arboviruses and how to clean your house and the surroundings for this, because these simple things can protect the human, uh, the human population enormously. And again, often these viruses don't cause a problem in the rodent vector. It's when they spread into humans. Now, just like with the arboviruses, we have a huge number of these viruses, and I don't expect you to learn all of these uh, names. Uh, I think there's a few that you do need to be aware of. Um, okay. A lot of them cause hemorrhagic fevers. So here I've listed a pile that cause hemorrhagic fevers. That's what the HS is. So one thing is you need to be aware that there are a lot of nasty viruses that cause hemorrhagic fevers, uh, and they need, from the public health point of view, they need to be identified. So again, when you get hemorrhagic fevers, you need to inform the, the authorities. Uh, the other story from here is that we have a lot of these in South America. So if you see hemorrhagic fevers in people who have been traveling in South America, um, then uh, one thing is to suspect that they might be of viral origin. Uh, and as I say, since these are spread via household uh, contact with rodent droppings, there are co the precautions you can take. Um, we do have them the, a few years ago. 2002, 2003, somewhere around there. Um, we had a, an outbreak of several deaths due to one of these viruses, which was called Whitewater Arroyo, because they've all named from where they were originally found. Um, so don't remember all these individual names. The important thing to know is there are a lot of these kind of hemorrhagic fevers. Lassa fever is one that is thought maybe to be something that can be hooked on in bioterrorism, um, so, uh, and it has a nasty well, a lot of these have nasty case fatality rates. Um, so this has been, this often sort of breaks into the news. And this is, occurs in Africa. And again, when, you, when people have been traveling and they come back with hemorrhagic fevers, there's a pile of virus or potential virus origins that need to be considered in the differential diagnosis. Uh, what we do have in this country is something called lymphocytic chorio-meningitis, which is, has a much lower case fatality rate than these. Uh, and is, as it says, a, a meningitis. It's not a hemorrhagic fever. Uh, it's widespread. It tends to be um, fairly minor in terms of most of its symptoms, but it can be serious. And it's frequently in um, pet rodents and hamsters, guinea pigs and so on. Um, so what you get with the hemorrhagic fevers is, is dehydration, hemoconcentration, hemorrhage shock, because again, you get leakage from the blood vessels so it's kind of what, the same thing we talked about with dengue hemorrhagic fever. These are another group of viruses that can associate it with that. But dengue, you're concerned about human urban cycle transmission. Here, you're concerned about the, the contaminated environment from rodents. And the case fatality rates can be quite high for these viruses, 5 to 35 percent. LCM is often subclinical. And if it's clinical, it's often another of these nonspecific flu-like type of symptoms. But you can get meningitis and encephalitis, uh, and the patients usually recover, but there may be sequelae. And as I say, it's frequently associated with people who handle either pet rodents or um, people in uh, animal facilities <coughs> in various places. So animals are very carefully screened for this in the animal facilities of 
universities and so on, because you don't want to get this around. So really, the things, that, probably the things to remember, typically the arena viruses are serious because they cause hemorrhagic fevers. If you want to remember one associated with those, I would suggest you remember Lassa. But also remember that they are common in these hemorrhagic fevers due to arena viruses are common in South America. So that's a risk factor in people coming in with them. Any questions on those? Okay. Let me, if I can just finish the hantaviruses and then we'll take a break, is that okay? And then we'll get on to prions in the next lecture. Um, the hantaviruses, again, these all have a rodent vector. Uh, and typically, they were associated with hemorrhagic fevers, uh, but in these cases, not only did the patients get a hemorrhagic fever, which is what the HF stands for, there also tended to be a renal syndrome with renal dysfunction. Um, so hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, HF, RS. And one of the more serious ones of these, because it's got a higher case fatality rate than many of the others, is one called Korean, uh, and which occurs in Southeast Asia. Uh, and from the American point of view, this was a particularly serious problem during the Vietnam War uh, because a lot of troops went down with Korean hemorrhagic fever. But um, it's widespread through there, and so it's a problem throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, and again, it's transmitted by rodents, same transmission route. Um, elsewhere, there are other hemorrhagic fever, renal syndrome viruses with much lower case fatality rates uh, and they occur Europe and Asia. And we thought that in the US we were free of these kind of things. And then some years ago, um, there was an outbreak of a, an acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, which nobody knew what was causing it. But patients were dying at the, uh, initially with something like a 75% case fatality rate. It was very scary. And there was a sudden outbreak at, at that stage in the Southwest. Uh, and... One thing is, as soon as CD, CDC tested it for top viral toxins for every virus they could think of, and as soon as they discovered that there was some cross-reaction with some other hantavirus antibodies, then they realized that they were dealing with a hantavirus. As soon as they realized they were dealing with a hantavirus, since this is one of the advantages of these classification schemes, since they knew that all the other closely related hantaviruses were spread by rodents, they immediately went and screened the rodent population and found that, yes, this was being carried in the rodents. And now you know how it's being spread, you can immediately tell people how to minimize their chances of getting infected. So this is a case where just knowing the viral taxonomy, that, that within a few days, CDC was going around everywhere telling people not to clean up this stuff until they knew how to handle it, it would be properly <coughs> handled, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a hantavirus here that doesn't cause hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, it causes predominantly a pulmonary syndrome. Uh, and basically what happens is that the, the lungs fill with fluid and the patient can't breathe uh, and it can be fatal. So um, I've mentioned this and again, the transmission route is just as it was with the arena viruses we talked about. Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is transmitted by different rodents around the country. And there are multiple different hantaviruses around the country that cause this. Um, the one that was originally isolated is known as sin nombre, which is really curious because it means without a name. So this virus's name is no name. Uh, <coughs> so it can be caused by various members, including sin nombre, and we have uh, several members of this family that are circulating in this country. And it seems to be, we normally don't see too many cases, but you have a year when there's a huge crop of whatever this particular rodent likes to eat. The rodent populations bloom. Uh, and then the next year, um, you have way less food and they start trying to go into human habitations to find what they can and you get these kinds of problems. Um, so it's now occurred, for some reason, these viruses really don't like South Carolina, um, but it's occurred through the western U.S. very widely and various cases through the eastern U.S. And as I say, um, the cases, the, the mice, the, the rodents that transmit it over here are not necessarily the same as the rodents that transmit it over here and it's not even necessarily the same strain of virus. But these cases have occurred and the current case fatality rate now is about 
Uh, cases have been recognised more readily, uh, and once you know what you're in for, um, the uh, intensive care can see many of these patients through. But it's still a very nasty disease with that kind of ca uh, case fatality rate. Symptoms include the standard things that you see, fever, myalgia. You get it into the lungs, so it's not surprising you get a cough. Uh, you get nausea, vomiting, and then you get shortness of breath because your lungs are filled up with this stuff. Uh, occasionally, you can get upper respiratory tract symptoms, but more, low, more usually it's lower respiratory tract. And this is just an x-ray of a patient. Here they are on May 27th. Uh, Obviously not feeling too well because somebody's bothered to take a, a, an, an x-ray of them. And look how much fluid is there in their lungs on May 30th. Horrendous. This person actually survived. Because as I say, if you get them to, to care promptly, uh, this is, can be dealt with in intensive care to a certain extent, but it's still a high case fatality rate. Actually, can I go until 11 and then we can just finish this entirely and come to the prion diseases afterwards. Um, the other thing I just want to briefly mention, because there's nowhere else to put them, is there are these hemorrhagic fevers. A lot These hemorrhagic fevers, whatever they're caused by, can be really nasty and very painful and very unpleasant to have, even if you can survive it with a high rate. But there are many of these hemorrhagic fevers have these very high case fatality rates. Uh, and one that gets a lot of coverage are um, Ebola and Marburg viruses. They occur in Africa. Uh, we don't have them in this country. Uh, occasionally, they may spread out of Africa in infected primates, which go to zoos or laboratories or whatever. Um, but usually, you meet them in Africa. We don't know what the vector is. No idea. But it can be passed very readily from human to human because people with these hemorrhagic fevers are bleeding everywhere. The blood is full of the virus. If you get it in um, contact, it with mucous membranes or something, you can pick it up, so it, or infected needles, whatever. Um, it reads really serious barrier nursing, uh, as does latter fever and some of these others. Um, the vector, as I say, is unknown. The virus is like a um, super size me rabies virus. It's very, very long, but it's got the same shrink-wrapped, slinky type of nuclear capsid. It's also negative strand. Um, so they're called filoviruses. Of course, filo means thread-like. And again, it's, there's a concern these can be used for bioterrorism. Quite honestly, I have difficulty seeing how you can use them for bioterrorism uh, because it's so obvious you immediately isolate the people that it's, uh, it could cause a big scare. Um, these are, I said they were called filoviruses. You can see how thread-like they are. These two aren't on the same scale. Um, they're, they're both the same size of viruses, but you can see these thread like this is Ebola, um, this is Marburg. It, usually we see outbreaks of Ebola in Africa, so we've seen very little Marburg, and then last year there was a huge outbreak of um, several hundred cases in Angola. Despite the, the, I mean, help comes from worldwide when you get one of these outbreaks, so they had a lot of help, and despite all the public health things, it's really difficult to get these back under control. Uh, but the, the thing is, you have to be very careful about the nursing. And funeral practices, you know, things like you don't go up and kiss the body and things like this, which can be really problem in, in areas where there are traditions. You have to overcome those traditions, and, and it, that's always a problem. Um, so they cause hemorrhagic fevers. The case fatality rate can be as high as 60 to 90 percent. Very unpleasant death. Uh, high risk of contaminate uh, of in transmitting the infection to nursing staff, family members, funeral workers. Um, it's, they occur in Africa. The natural reservoir isn't, unknown, isn't known. You see it in monkeys and apes, and that may be how people in Africa pick it up by hunting these creatures, uh, but it doesn't seem they're the natural host. It seems something else is the natural host for this. You get a very high viremia, and as I say, you bleed everywhere, so you need stringent barrier nursing. Oh, this was just that outbreak last year. 374 cases, 329 deaths. Scary. Okay, thank you. So let's get back at 10 minutes past the hour. <laughs>